this is the Colt Walker. Now, most of the time when people introduce this firearm, they have a saying that goes something like, this was the most powerful handgun up until the advent of the 357 Magnum, which is a bold statement to be sure. The only problem is it's not exactly true. I know, I know, hear me out. Now the Walker has reached a level of fame that would rival that of some Greek mythology. And there's a few reasons for this, I think. One, it's warranted to a degree. The Walker is a very powerful firearm. Just in case anyone's wondering, I'm not arguing that it's not powerful. It most certainly is. Especially for the time. When this firearm came out in late 1847, the other revolver that was available from Colt was the Patterson, which was a five-shot, generally, 36 caliber, considerably weaker than this thing. So it is warranted, and it does deserve its place in history as being a very powerful, very influential firearm. The second thing being that, uh, well, people tend to exaggerate. And the third being that in this day and age, we have a much wider variety of powders and projectiles that we could use for our walker. For example, you could get Pyrot XP or 777 or any one of those wretched black powder substitutes, load this with 60 grains in a round ball and get almost 1,500 feet per second which is about 700 foot-pounds of energy, which is, again, exceptionally powerful. The issue with that, though, is they didn't have 777 in 1847 and 1848. So my goal in this particular presentation is to see what the power level is of the walker with the historical context in mind. Well, what do I mean by that? In 1847 and 8, they would have had two projectiles that you could use for this. One of them is a good old-fashioned round ball, which is anywhere from 451 to 457, weighing anywhere from 141 to 148 grains. The other projectile, which I don't have, is the original conical that came with the mold for this firearm. Now, the original Walker Conical, I think, weighed about 200 grains, but it was very difficult to load because it didn't have a rebated heel. So what a lot of guys did is they would load them backwards, and that probably had something to do with a lot of the Walkers having rapid chemical decompositions of their cylinders, but that's a whole nother story. So for this test, since I don't have those Conicals, I'm going to use these third model Dragoon Conicals, and they weigh 261 grains, or at least all the ones I weighed, that's what they averaged. And these come from an Era's Gone bullet mold, and they are pretty serious looking. That's a big chunk of lead. Now, I think this is appropriate because if you were one of the few people that still had your hands on a walker in 1852, because those bullets came out, I believe, 1851, that's the bullet that you probably would have been able to obtain easily and definitely easier to load than the original Walker style conical. So that's what I'm going to use. Now, as far as the powder, I'm going to use 3F Swiss. That's what I like. That's what I prefer. Now, there are hundreds of other videos out there of people shooting their Walkers with Goex, Schutzen, Swiss, and all manner of unclean, unholy black powder substitutes but I'm gonna stick with 3F Swiss. Now, as far as people exaggerating what the Walker really is capable of as far as energy foot-pounds, I wanna show you this clip of Phil Schreier. Now, most people know who Phil is. You've probably seen him on the interweb somewheres. He is the senior curator for the NRA Museum. Now, I don't doubt that Phil knows his stuff, but listen to what he says here. This cylinder can hold 90 grains of gunpowder if you really pack it in there and then you put a 200 grain bullet on top of it, you've got larger than a standard U.S. infantry musket charge in a handgun. Now, I don't know if maybe the original real Colt Walker had a little bit longer cylinder, 
but I don't see how you could fit 90 grains of powder in there with a 200 grain bullet and still be able to seat that. Here's another one. He stands over a wounded and bleeding perpetrator. He levels his revolver at him and says, this is a 44 Magnum, the most powerful handgun in the world, and it will blow your head clean off. Well, that's a popular line to repeat. One of uh, NRA board members, uh, John Milius, actually wrote that line. It's uh, <laughs> on the AFI uh, Top 100 movie quotes, uh, along with three other quotes of John's. Um, but it's just simply like a lot of Hollywood uh, films, just simply not true. Because at the time the film was made, still the most powerful handgun, on production handgun on planet Earth was the Colt 1847 Walker Revolver. It fired a 451 caliber round ball. It delivered initial muzzle velocity of over 1,500 feet per second out of a 200 grain bullet, um, which exceeds standard Smith & Wesson 44 Magnum loads. <laughs> Now, I've heard the claim that the Walker is more powerful than the 357 a, a thousand times. I've heard, a, I've heard that I don't know how many times. But saying that the Walker is more powerful than a 44 Magnum is uh, borderline ridiculous. <laughs> now, again, maybe if you pack it with 50 grains of triple seven and the 260 grain round ball, maybe it'll get some energy that might get close, but it's not going to match or beat the 44 Magnum. So again, people tend to exaggerate. And these are just some of the claims that I've heard when people talk about the power that the Walker is capable of. Another thing that might play into this is movies and pop culture. Everyone's seen Josie Wales. Why, well, you're gonna pull those pistols and whistle Dixie. And everyone knows that Gus McRae carries one in Lonesome Dove. Okay, now I'm the one exaggerating, right? But seriously, I've heard people describe the Walker's power that pretty much looks like what I just showed you. Now, I am going to reference some other folks' videos for this just to kind of compare what my numbers were to theirs. And some of them I was able to recreate just fine, and others I didn't even come close. But we'll discuss that in a little bit. Now, Mark Hubbs, who is the uh, owner and proprietor of Era's Gone Bullet Molds, he has a video where he shoots his walker, and he claims he's using 40 grains. And he doesn't have a chronograph, but that's fine. And he mentions in the video that he tried loading 45 grains and couldn't seat the bullet far enough to get it to clear the forcing cone. Now, I started with 40 grains and immediately ran into trouble. So here's how that went. I've seen people claim they get 50 grains in there. I have 40 grains of 3F Swiss and one of these conicals. And I'm going to have to clip it to get the thing in. So, or hit it with a hammer. No. Okay, get the hammer. <laughs> so I had to get the right amount of uh, leverage to get it to seat, which uh, I was able to get it to seat, but as you might notice, this uh, is taking a new angle. So I don't know how these people claim they get 50 in there with the conical, but Wait a minute. Yeah, that's 40. That says 40 right there. That's what I used, and that's 3F Swiss. So. Not happening. Somebody's dying to me, man. <laughs> okay, so I have my one conical loaded with 40 grains, just barely. Thousand even. There, how am I supposed to get forty grains in there? You mean fifty? Well, no, way. I can't get forty in there. That's right. That's Let right. alone fifty. I guess I'm gonna have to back it down to thirty-five. We can cut the end of the lead off. Yeah, I don't want to do that though. Yeah. 
Now, I suppose it's possible that the cylinder of my walker is just a little shorter than theirs. I suppose that's possible. But when I have to bend my loading lever to seat that stuff, I would say that's an issue. I'd say that's a problem. If you were in a firefight and you had too much powder to try to seat that conical, you'd have to pick up a rock to hammer your loading lever to get that thing to seat. So I only got that one shot off with 40 grains. So since I had so much trouble with the 40 grain load in this, I backed it down to 35 grains of 3F Swiss with the 260 grain conical just to see what would happen. 35 grains, 3F Swiss with the Eras Gone 260 grain third model Dragoon bullet. Nine twelve. Nine oh nine. That's okay. That happens sometimes. Damn. I got a cap stuck in there. I can feel it. 927. 9-11. 9-07. And 75. Well, that averaged 913 feet per second, which is respectable. Definitely. Now... Dustin Weiniger from Guns of the West, he has a video where he tries both 40 and 45 grains of 3F Go-X, and he didn't seem to have any trouble. Now again, I'm using 3F Swiss, so maybe it's that the Swiss is a little bit harder to compress than the Go-X. Maybe that's uh, the case. Let's give that a try. Here's our 3F Go-X. And I'm doing this part with Go-X because I thought maybe the 3F Swiss is a little harder to compress. And I've got 35 grains. That's a nice ring, and as you can see, pretty decent amount of room there. Now let's try 40. And there's 40. Need more, need more bullets. All right. Good. In there. Let's not spill a pound of Go X. All right. Okay. Well, it looks like. Go-X is more easily compressed. Now let's try 45. 45. that <laughs> uh -huh. 
Uh-huh. That's what I thought. Yep. All right. Now let me wrench on this to try and seat it. All right, so there it is. We have it seated enough to clear the forcing cone. So we have 35, 40, and 45 grains of 3F GoX. And as you can see, that thing is just barely down enough to get it to go. So I think the issue I was having is the Swiss is much harder to compress compared to the GoX. Now they're both 3F, but uh, that definitely makes a difference. Okay, so I think it's safe to say that GoX is more easily compressed than Swiss. But one thing that I do know is that typically substitutes are even easier to compress. Now, Carl from InRange, he did a video recently on his walker where he claims that he's using 50 grains of 3F powder. Now, he didn't say in the video, but I asked him, I left him a comment and I asked him what uh, powder he was using, and he said he was using GoX. But he claims he's using 50 grains in the same 260 grain conical, which I'll admit, when I first saw that, I thought there was, there was no way. Now, Carl <laughs> claims he's using 50 grains of 3F GoX, so I guess we'll have to give this a try. I think I already know how this is going to go. That's a pretty considerable powder charge. <laughs> yeah, I was afraid of that. Well, let me try wrenching on it some more and I'll see if I can't get it seated. Well, son of a bitch, we got it seated. But my ramrod, again, had to get bent in order to do it. And not in the way that I usually tell people to get bent. So, 35, 40... 45, 50. So is it possible? Yeah, I guess if you have a hammer or something to use for your ramrod to seat it. Now just for sport, let's try 50 grains of this 777 stuff and see if we can't get that to seat. All right. Same. <clears throat> Not yet. Gonna have to beat on it. All right. So this is kind of interesting. I still had to beat on my loading lever, but I was able to seat that triple seven load even farther down with 50 grains than the 50 grains of 3F GoX. So I had a feeling that the substitutes would be compressed, well, would compress easier, but I still had to tap on my poor loading lever to get it to seat. Now, as far as if any of this is 
practical. Uh, to me, it looks like, depending on the powder, 40 grains is about it. 45 is a stretch, and 50 is definitely get an extra tool to seat the thing. I suppose that he could have done that if uh, he had a hammer or a pipe that he could use for his loading lever, and his loading lever didn't look, and I've bent mine back since then. It was even worse, as you could see in the previous video there. Now, he didn't mention anything about the ease or lack thereof of loading that 50 grain charge with that conical, but if you look at how far those bullets are seated, that doesn't look like a 50 grain charge to me. I could be wrong, and I don't mean to accuse anybody of anything. I'm just telling you what it looks like in my not-so-humble professional opinion. That doesn't look like 50 grains. Also, to go even further, that doesn't look like Goex to me. Here's a close-up shot of his supposed 50 grain spout with 3F Goex, and that doesn't look like Goex to me. Here's a close-up shot of Goex in my measurer, and you can see that it's pretty shiny. And here's a side-by-side -side of Goex on the right and Pyrodex RS on the left. And here's a side-by-side -side of Carl's powder versus some real 3F Goex. Again, that doesn't look like Goex to me. I could be wrong, but it doesn't look like that to me. And the reason why I bring this up is because Carl's numbers are, well, a little strange to me. Again, he says he's using 50 grains of 3F Goex and that same 260 grain conical. Now, he gets 1,020 on average with that load with 600 foot-pounds of energy. Again, considerably powerful. But then he does a round ball test with 60 grains and a round ball, and he's getting almost mid-13s. Now, here's where things get a little funny to me. I did a test with 60 grains of 3F Swiss and a round ball, and here's how that went. 60 grains and a round ball. Bang. 13.07. Wow. That's rocking. Mm. Out of that fucker. Mm -hmm. Jesus. 12.55. Watch uh, True Grit. I've seen the new one. The old one was a shit. 12.32. Eleven ninety five. Eleven fifty nine. Jeez. And eleven fifty nine again. Now, I've done this test more than a few times, and I typically get right about twelve twenty five with sixty grains of three F Swiss and that same round ball. Now, he's using the same powder that I think objectively is a lesser quality than Swiss. I, I don't mean to pick on Goex, but Swiss is a better powder. I don't care how you slice it. So he's using the same powder charge with the same ball, and he's getting over 100 feet per second faster velocities than what I get on an average. Okay. But then with his conical test, he's using 50 grains of the same powder same projectile I'm using, and he's averaging 1,020. With the one shot I had with 40, I got 1,000. Now, again, I wasn't about to go through that five more times, but that seems kind of strange. Now, you might be thinking, you know, well, the temperature and the ambient humidity and uh, barometric pressure and elevation, you know, all can, you know, change what your numbers are. And yeah, that's fair. But out of all the other numbers that I've looked at from all these other videos, they're very, very close within generally 40 or 50 feet per second from what I got with mine, again, depending on 2F or 3F or GoX or Swiss or whatever. They're all pretty close, but Carl's doesn't seem to add up to me. Now, again, I'm not accusing anyone of anything. I'm not looking for a fight. It just seems a little strange. And if I had to go out on a limb, I would say... At the very least, he's probably using Pyrodex. And 
I know Carl is a, has a huge channel, so maybe whoever responded with the GoX response to my question, maybe they didn't know. Maybe he has someone that works for him. I, I can make excuses for him all day long. I'm trying to give everyone the benefit of the doubt. But again, in my professional opinion, that didn't act or look like real black powder to me. I could be wrong. Now, remember earlier when I said that the Walker wasn't the most powerful handgun until the advent of the 357 Magnum, and I'd explain later? Well, here it is. The 45 Colt. Oh, you knew I was going to say that, right? In 1873, the 45 Colt cartridge was introduced, and it came out with the 1873 Single Action Army or the Model P, whatever you'd like to call it. The original load for 45 Colt was 40 grains of powder. Whoa, whoa. I know it's 2F, not 3, with a 250 grain bullet. In that firearm, the seven and a half inch barrel Colt single action army, that round produces 604 foot pounds of energy at about 1,050. Now, I made some, because I typically use 3F, but I made some using two to, again, keeping the historical context in mind, and ran it through a seven and a half inch barrel Colt copy to see what we'd get. So here's how that went. So this is 45 Colt with 40 grains of 2F and a 50, 250 grain bullet. Thousand eighteen. Thousand fifty one. Thousand sixty four. Thousand thirty nine. Thousand forty six. Thousand forty six. So, 1,043 feet per second on average with 604 foot pounds of energy, which beats the snot out of all of my other tests that I did with the Walker, including Carl's load here, which again I could not duplicate. And just about every other video I've seen where people are using real black powder regardless of the conical or bullet ball, whatever you'd like to call it, and regardless of the powder charge. The 45 Colt in a 40 grain charge beats the Walker. At the very least, the 45 Colt with 40 grains is just as powerful as the Walker. I think it's perfectly fair to say that the Walker was the most powerful cap and ball pistol, but the 45 Colt beats the Walker, even with the outrageous charges where you have to beat it in there with a hammer. Now, you might be thinking that the 40 grain charge of black powder in a 45 Colt didn't last very long. The Army didn't use it that long. And yeah, that's fair. In fact, I read an article by a very well known, respected gun writer recently saying that the 40 grain charge, the 40 grain load, was actually never used. The military never used it. They went right to 35 and then reduced it from there, which uh, is debatable, I, I think. But the problem I have with this is you can find advertisements going back as early as 1880 of Remington's UMC advertising 45 Colt loads loaded with 40 grains, and a 250 grain bullet. And you can find these. I'll, I'll show you some here. So I don't know why a lot of folks say that it doesn't matter or it doesn't count because the military didn't use it. Well, okay, fine. Maybe the military did, didn't, but you as a civilian could still go to the hardware store and buy a box of Remington UMC loaded with 40 grains of powder and a 250 grain bullet. Now, I'll say it one more time because it seems like the people that are really excited about the walkers are really excited about them. In fact, my friends and I, we call it the Colt Walker, the C-U-L-T Walker, not Colt, because the people that are into these, they, they really chant the chant when it comes to 
how great and powerful the walker is. And again, I'll say it one more time, the walker is a very powerful firearm. It's a very powerful handgun. But it wasn't the most powerful revolver made until the advent of the 357 Magnum. Sorry to ruin your day. So, as usual, folks, if you thought this video didn't suck, do me a favor and hit the like button and consider subscribing. And if you did think it sucked, well, then go make your own damn video.